Okay, so that's Mark, chap Mark chapter 6, uh, verses 45 down to verse 52. Okay, and John, okay, we are also in John chapter 6, and this is recorded in John chapter 6, verse 16, okay, down to verse 21. But we'll look into, I uh, will read beginning with uh, John chapter 6, verse 15. Okay, so is that confusing? Uh, does that, is that confusing you? No, all right. So can I ask all of us to stand on our feet for a while? Let's begin with John chapter 6, verse 15. Okay, verse 15 down to verse 21. Okay, um, yeah. C can we turn on the lights? Are they on? All right. John chapter 6, verse 15. It says here, Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. And then... When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. When they were, then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Okay, this specific account, okay, uh, in the book of Mark, chapter 6, is found in verse 45. Okay, exactly the same story. It says here, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida. All right, while he dismissed the crowd, all 15,000 of them. After he had taken, uh, and sorry, and after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost. And they cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded. For they did not understand about the lobes, but their hearts were hardened. Let's pray for a while. Heavenly Father, we come before you here. Uh, in this place tonight, Lord, first and foremost, Lord, to worship you corporately as a local church. We come before you, Lord, today to, uh, to adore your name, to look once again into your word, to worship you, Lord, through singing, uh, to worship you, God, with your giving. Lord, to generally, God, to worship you, Lord, because you deserve to be worshipped. And so, God, as we look into another Lord, a miracle that has transpired, uh, Lord, a miracle that has been recorded, uh, Lord, in the gospel accounts. Lord, I pray that you would as well open our eyes uh, the same way that you've opened the eyes of the disciples. Lord, that we will see the truth about who you are. Lord, that all of these miracles, Lord, as we understand, basically point to you. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us the privilege to look into your word here today. Allow us, Lord, to treasure our time this morning, in your name we pray, amen and amen. You can all be seated now. Okay, um, here's the thing. Um, yeah. You will have to, um, if you were not here last Sunday, um, the passage that we are covering here today actually uh, is, you know, uh, coming from the heels of what we've covered last Sunday. So meaning to, say, um, meaning to say, I'm not saying it's a prerequisite, but uh, in order for us to fully embrace okay, the story of Jesus walking on water, okay, we would first need to understand okay, uh, the story we're in. Uh, we saw Jesus feeding uh, 5,000 men. Okay? We did say that all in all, it could have been fifteen or 12,000 people okay, uh, that Jesus fed during that time. And then if you remember... Um, when, when Jesus did that, okay, uh, they were astonished, uh, and they made comparisons, okay? Uh, they were, like, comparing in their mind uh, that this is the miracle of Moses, 
or this was rather the miracle of Elijah. And in the end, we understand that Jesus actually is the greater miracle worker. He's also the greater provider. All right? So Jesus actually did all of those things intentionally. Okay? It was done on purpose. And so now, in John chapter 6, okay, I added verse 15 because like what I said, this story is uh, taking off from the heels of what happened uh, in the, in the, in the, uh, when, when Jesus fed the 5,000. So it says here, uh, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. So we kind of get a picture. Okay, Jesus stayed behind, isn't it? Okay, he stayed behind too. What do you think? Uh, it's, it was actually there, all right? So in Mark chapter 6, he, stayed, he actually stayed behind to pray, all right? He actually stayed behind to pray, and his disciples went out to the sea. And then uh, just, to, just to at least uh, summarize the story, and what happened next, we understand that while they were in the sea, uh, something happened, a, 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 a storm comes in, okay, and they were tossed while they were in the boat, and they were rowing and rowing for like, I don't know, for like seven, six hours, and uh, they were not getting anywhere. And then suddenly what happened next, okay, they saw from a distance, what? Jesus walking on water. Okay, and that is the miracle that has transpired, okay, in that very place. You know, uh, this is an important story, okay? Um, last Sunday, I did say that uh, when Jesus fed the 5,000, okay, when Jesus fed the 5,000, it was important in, in, in a sense that it was recorded in all four gospel accounts. This story, okay, is recorded in all, uh, in three of the four gospel accounts, okay? So it gives us a picture that this is, uh, this is an important or integral story that actually, uh, you know, that actually showed the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, um, I'm not sure if you know this, but uh, the, the American Navy, okay, or U.S. sailors, okay, have taken, okay, have taken their, what do you call this, their song, I don't know what you call that, but their song, okay, from these passages that we have. Okay, um, there, is a, uh, there is a hymn, okay, a famous one, okay, uh, that was uh, you know, uh, written in 1860 by William Whiting uh, that talks about, uh, and it was entitled, Eternal Father Strong to Save. That's actually taken from this, from this story that we have, okay, when Jesus walked on water. Okay, so um, I'm, not, I, I'm not sure about this, but I am assuming that all of us here, have never seen anyone walk on water. What do you think about that, right? So, okay, uh, you, you folks know about the Jesus lizard? You know that, the Jesus lizard? You see this in National Geographic? You see this uh, lizard with webbed feet that will try to make strides uh, on, on, on the water, would try to run uh, on top of, of, of any water, but you know, it's just good for like, what, 10 feet? Then after which, I don't know, uh, either they drown or they swim. I'm not sure because all National Geographic shows us is the feet that they do for 10 to 15 feet. feet. Okay, so that as well, okay, uh, the name of that lizard as well is taken from this uh, story that we have here uh, this, uh, this morning. Okay, so now um, let me just look into this. Um, you know, um, you'll have to time me because... I'm actually interchanging between two sermons, so, all right, so, because I have John and I have Mark. Okay, now, okay, let me look, let me look into this now. So, um, Jesus was doing all of these signs, okay, slash miracles, okay, we did say that uh, when it's a miracle, it is a sign, it is meant to point at something, okay, that's how we understand uh, these miracles when we started off this series. Now, he was doing miracles not to show off, isn't it? Right? You have friends who are like that, okay? Or were you like that when you were perhaps young, when you went to Milo Best, uh, you show your dribbling skills to show off, okay? Or, or so. Jesus wasn't doing all of these miracles, okay, to show off. But I'd like for us to understand that all of these are, uh, are purposive, okay? So Jesus has two purposes, or he had two purposes as to why, okay, as to why he walked on water. Number one is this, okay, he walked on water first and foremost to show his divinity. So, all right, so I'm getting straight to the point. He walked on water to show his divinity. 
all right, to show that he is God, okay? So what do we have here? Um, to whom was he showing his divinity? Okay, he was showing his divinity to, who was his, who was his audience during the time? To his disciples, right? Because it was his disciples who were on that boat on the rough sea during or in the middle of a storm. So Jesus was showing his divinity to his disciples. That's why in Mark chapter 6, okay, in Mark chapter 6, okay, if you, if you could go there for a while, all right, it says here, look at this, um, where is that? It says here in verse 48, he saw that they were making headway painfully for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. So he sent them off, okay? He sent them off early, and yet they were still rowing against the wind. It gives us a picture that the disciples were actually, what? Rowing for a good six or seven hours against what? Against a strong current, okay? So they were, they were rowing, uh, they were rowing with all their might. And here's what's interesting. I realized that, I realized that if you look at the Bible, you would come to understand that storms or darkness, okay, if you, if you look at this account right here in the New Testament, and then you compare this with the book of Psalms, you would realize that storms or darkness is actually a what? It is actually an illustration of what is happening in the heart. So meaning to say, the external things that we're seeing here, if, if we see storm happening during that time, it gives us a picture that actually the real storm was happening in the hearts of the disciples. All right? So there was, there was darkness externally. All right? There was a storm. There, uh, externally, they are witnessing a storm. But internally, we have to understand that there was also a storm that was brewing, brewing in their heart. Why do I say that? Look at verse 52 of Mark chapter 6. Look at verse 52. It says here, for the disciples, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were, do we have that? All right, there it is. But their hearts were hardened. That's interesting. The reason why I'm pulling out the book of Mark, because I'd like for us to, you know, because John chapter 6 simply gives us a picture or a snapshot of what has happened. But Mark gives us some details. So it gives us a picture that, okay, wait a second, wait. Look at this. Here's what's happening. Jesus fed 5,000 people. Jesus fed 12,000 people. Jesus fed 15,000 people. And yet it says here in verse 52, when they were rowing and rowing and rowing, Jesus showed up because there's a reason why Jesus showed up. He showed up because their hearts were hardened. Oops. What do we have here? Um, it simply gives us a picture that, all right, all the disciples have witnessed a miracle transpired that Jesus fed thousands of people. They have, they, have, they, have, they have witnessed it themselves. And yet, guess what? Their hearts, together with the group of people who were confessing that he is indeed the prophet, the truth of the matter is they were actually what? Enveloped with unbelief still. They were so mesmerized they were so mesmerized with Jesus feeding the thousands of people without them realizing that Jesus himself is the bread coming from heaven whose body will be broken to feed their very own souls. So their hearts were hardened. It's like, uh, it's like Jesus was like, if Jesus was saying, ah, you guys don't get it. He was talking to the crowd and they don't get it. Guess what? His inner circle, they themselves don't get it as well. Okay, they didn't get it. Okay, together with the rest of the people, they understood. It's kind of like this. Um, it's kind of like this. They have Jesus who was who turned water into wine. They had Jesus who healed this person. And here's their conclusion. It's something like this. Their conclusion is, oh, my friend right here, my rabbi right here has power. They don't realize that he is the power. They kind of, they, they, they look at Jesus and they realize, okay, wait a second. This man is from God, but they don't realize that this man is God. So they haven't, they haven't reached that threshold yet of fully declaring and believing that this man, this rabbi, this teacher, this discipler of ours is actually God himself. 
So the external danger here, the external danger of the storm, is actually just a picture, all right? Everybody say picture. It is just a picture of the internal danger. Look at this. The internal danger of not knowing who Jesus is. This is interesting because I feel like, uh, I feel like a lot of us can relate to this, okay? All of us here in this place can relate to this. Why? Because I realize that we are, all of us here, we are all insiders, okay? We are all insiders in a sense that we are here in church every Sunday, we serve in the church, all right? We, we lead Bible study groups, our own victory groups. We serve Jesus, but sometimes there is a danger that we know something about Him, but we don't really know Him. Our folks with me. And that was the storm that was happening in the, in the lives of the disciples. It's like they were always around Jesus. They were always around Jesus, and yet they don't really know who Jesus is. I want us to understand that um, it's actually a dangerous place to be in when you are someone who loves proclaiming a Jesus whom you have never experienced yourself. So, meaning to say, we could be talking about Christians like you and me, who loves evangelizing, who loves leading, who loves serving, and yet at the end of the day, when we start assessing our hearts, our lives, do we really know who Jesus is? Do we really know who Jesus is? I mean, that was a big question for the disciples. Okay, they were, they were witnessing all of these good things that Jesus was doing, but they have failed to realize that the best thing was right there in front of them. Because like what Mark says, their hearts were actually hardened. Their hearts were actually hardened. And um, if, if, if I start looking into this, I realize that um, what, what hope, you know, um, come to think of this, um, my dad, before he became a Christian, okay, um, I, I think many of you know this, uh, my dad is a Chinese Muslim, all right, so he's Chinese, who grew up in a Muslim community, so, so you know, he, he, he embraced Islam, so I realized that, okay, when I start doing quote-unquote good deeds in order for me to preach the gospel, at the end of the day, I want you to understand this. In the years of being a pastor, I realized that sometimes, sometimes, it is easier to preach the gospel to unbelieving souls more than, okay, preaching the gospel to people who are in the church. If you're here and you grew up in Sunday schools, in kids' church, all your life you've been a Christian, or if you're here and you've been a Christian for, for several years now, several decades now, and sometimes we proudly and flippantly you know, toss around our quote-unquote Christian resume and Christian uh, credentials, that we are, that we have, that, ah, uh, me, I, I've been with Victory since they were in tavern. As for me, ah, uh, you, you know, Pastor Donnie and I, we were, we were good friends. We, 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 we run together, we bike together, and stuff like that. They, they, you run together. You can, you, some of you folks can say the same thing with me, though. When we flippantly, you know, um, toss all these Christian credentials, a lot of times I realize that when I talk to Christians, or when I counsel Christians, it's a lot more difficult to make them embrace the gospel more than someone who hasn't really encountered the Lord Jesus Christ. They've been around for so long that they've actually missed the point. What does it say in Romans chapter 3 verse 23? Oh, this is what it says in Romans chapter 3 verse 23. What's your, what's your eschatological worldview? Ah, you know what I think in terms of soteriology, this is what it means. 
You know, so and so, you know, this preacher, that preacher, that preacher over there, you know, Paul Washer, you know, this person, this person, that person, all of these guys. I've been in this denomination when I was young. I was with this person. I, I used to be an elder in, a pre, in, in my previous church. You know what my question for those people? So, my question now is, do you love Jesus? Is that evident in our life? Don't get me wrong, friends. Don't get me wrong. You know what? Uh, I, I listen to so many preachers. I'm just saying that a lot of times it's more difficult to counsel people who has all the knowledge in the Bible, but it has only gotten in their heads. It has not reached their heart yet. And it is not Jesus' doing. It is your own doing because you so much rely on what? Head knowledge. On volunteerism. On religiosity. You realize that there are some problems at home and God is starting to break you so that you could actually open up to your friends in church and at least be honest with what's happening in your life. And here you are. Okay, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna sing three times a day, I'm gonna serve, I'm gonna serve in the tech ministry four times a day, whatever. Whatever you ask for me, I'm gonna do it. Because that's my way of worshiping and serving the Lord. You know, that's actually good. But in terms of your depth, in your relationship with the Lord, baka 15 years na, 20 years na mababaw pa rin. And this is what was happening here. So, what is the hope for us Christians? Okay, listen, I'm not, I'm not singling out any of you. This is for all of us, amen? So, what is the hope for us? The hope for them as well as we understand, we preach the gospel, they come to church, praise God. What is the hope for us? We come here every single Sunday. What is the hope for us? You know what the hope for us is? This story. This is our hope. Jesus walking on water. Why? Why? Why is this such a big hope for us? Look at this. I'd like for us to look at Mark chapter 6. Look at verse 48. Look at verse 48. Look at this, it says here, and he saw that, Jesus saw, Jesus saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them, and about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, he meant to pass by them. You know, that's interesting. That's interesting. Number one, I want us to understand, they were physically drained. Ikaw kaya, magsagwan ng anim na oras. Right? They were physically drained, not just that, not just that, guess what? They were also what? Spiritually drained. Why were they spiritually drained? Because they can't find any category for their friend. They kind of like, um, what's the conclusion? Who is this person, Gaba? Who is this Jesus? He heals the blind, he heals the lame, he turns water into wine. They, seem, they cannot seem to make a final category for this person in their life. So they were not just physically drained. They were also what? Spiritually drained. And then it says here, look at this. This is interesting. Because it says here, verse 48, Jesus walked on water. Look at this. It says here, he meant to what? Look at that. <laughs> he meant to pass by them. What in the world is happening here? I mean, imagine this. Imagine this. I um, mean, verse 40, it says here, Jesus meant, it says here, Jesus meant, it was done on purpose, to pass by them. Say for instance, say for instance, this is the boat, and here comes Jesus. Instead of going straight to them, Jesus went, you know, he, he meant to pass by them. You know, um, I don't know, um, that looks like a prank. And friends, take note, okay, take note, it says here that Jesus was walking on water, he was not in the water, he wasn't swimming at all. And he meant to pass by them. What was he doing? Was he showing off? Oh, guys, guys, guys. Was it something like that? No. Like what I said, he, he meant to pass by them to, to let them see that he's walking on water so that what? So that he could show them their divinity so that they would put them in a category where indeed this is the Son of God. To put a category to tell them that he's God in all his fullness and glory. Because you folks remember this, there was also a story that they were in a boat, isn't it? 
right? And what happened when they were in a boat? A strong wind came, and what was Jesus doing? Oh my goodness, he was sleeping. And then when he, when he woke up, what happened? The Bible says he starts, he starts to what? To rebuke both the wind and the wave. A previous story tells us he stood up and rebukes the wind and the wave. And guess what happened next? His disciples were asking now, who is this person? What is this person? By, wa by walking on water, he starts giving them an answer to that previous question that he is God himself. That he is God himself. This is interesting because I realized that when Mark was writing this, his, he was actually alluding to the book of Exodus. Okay, will you please turn your Bibles with me for a while to Exodus chapter 33. Go to Exodus chapter 33. Let's begin with verse 18. It says here, let me begin with verse 17. And the, and the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight. I know you by name. Moses said, Lord, I beseech you, please show me your glory. Right? Show me your glory. And he said, look at this. Verse 19. And he said, I will make all my goodness. Look at this. Pass before you, right? I will make all my goodness pass before you. Take note of this. And I will, what? What do you have there? And will proclaim. So take note of those two words. God tells Moses, because you have been righteous, because you've been intimate with me. I want you to take note of that. I'm just paraphrasing this. Because you've been intimate with me. It's kind of like this. Because you did your quiet time, because you're walking righteously, because you're worshiping me, because you know me, here's your reward. Moses asked him, show me your glory. Your reward is, I'm going to pass by you and will proclaim my name to you. Catch it? Now, Mark picks that, that exact word in its original Hebrew and used that in Greek. Okay, and used that in Greek when he did say that Jesus meant to pass by them. Okay, that Jesus meant to pass by them. And here's what's interesting. Here's what's interesting. It, to Moses, God says, okay, I will proclaim my name. And what is his name? Okay, what is his name? As we understand, his name is Yahweh, which simply is I am. All right? He meant to pass by them. Okay, he meant to pass by them. And what does Jesus say? Do not be frightened. Do not be afraid. It is I. It is I. So the story that you have in Exodus chapter 33 is actually the same story that you have here. Jesus meant to pass by them and simply tell them, it is I, it is the Lord. His divine glory passed by His disciples. Okay, the way Moses... Okay, experienced, okay, God passing, okay, before him, okay, passing before him. And here, here's another thing that we, need to, that we need to understand, okay, he came there, he walked on water, not just to show his divinity, but here's another thing. He walked on water to come near to them with his divinity, all right? To come near to them with his divinity. Why? Why, why, why are we saying that? Look. Um, when was, okay, when was, uh, when, when did it happen, okay, or what, what, uh, what's the prerequisite, okay, for Moses that he started experiencing and seeing the glory of God, okay? He walked in, he walked uprightly, isn't it? Tama po ba? Are you following? Okay, sabi ni Lord, okay, 
para lang maintindihan natin. Sabi ni Lord, okay, I'm gonna show you my glory, okay? But guess what? Not the entirety of it, just my back. I'm gonna show it to you simply because you've walked uprightly. Okay? Because you are a righteous person, isn't it? Now, here's another thing. In the book of Mark, okay, now talking about the disciples, they saw the glory of God. Now, when did that, when did that happen? When they saw the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. In a period of intimacy? Come on now. Where they were, uh, do they, like what I said a while ago, do they have a category for the Lord Jesus Christ? They don't, uh, they have none of those yet. In a season of unbelief, Jesus comes to them to show them his divinity. No, I don't know with you, but I look at that and I realize, okay, this is good news to me. This is good news to me. Why? Because verse 48 says in Mark chapter 6, their hearts were hardened. During the time that their hearts were hardened, Jesus shows up. Come on now. Okay, you want me to equate that to what? Some of us or some of you might be experiencing here today. It's kind of like this. Um, during the time that you haven't been doing your devotion, as you said that you would do so on January 1, when we gave out those, those uh, calendars to you, Jesus comes to you with his divinity. When you're like what? You're, 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 right, you're right smack in the middle of your sin. Jesus comes to you in his divinity. When you're lasting over someone, Jesus comes to you in his divinity. When you have become a perpetual liar, it has become second nature to you, Jesus comes to you in his divinity. When you feel like cheating your wife, when you feel like cheating your husband, Jesus comes to you in his divinity. In a moment when you feel like, um, I, I want to I wanna give up my relationship with God, I want to walk away from the faith, Jesus comes to you in his divinity. That's what we have here. No, I don't know with, I don't know with you, but it, it, it comforts me to think that, all right, I don't really have... To entirely feel bad that I have missed my devotion. Because I know for a fact that Jesus will always draw himself closer to me. Meaning to say, he will cross any barrier to meet us. What barriers do you have right now? Doubt, unbelief, anger towards the church, anger towards God. Jesus can cross those, ba those barriers that you have in the darkest and the most stormy moments of your life. Internally and externally speaking, Jesus comes to you in his divinity. I mean, this is what we have here. Okay, they thought, look at this. In fact, in, Mark, in, in the book of Mark, okay, and Matthew, they thought Jesus was in a distance. They're like, man, we're rowing here. What's Jesus? Where's Jesus? What's, what's, what, what is he doing? He's there on the mountainside. They were starting to make a conclusion that Jesus was, guess what? Was absent in the midst of trial. You folks realize that the Bible says that he was walking on water, but it did not mention that, it was, that he wasn't wet. It didn't say that Jesus wasn't wet, that he wasn't, uh, that he wasn't experiencing what they were experiencing. It simply says that he walked on water. Gives them a picture that the Jesus that I worship can actually relate to my own problems. If you look at how God revealed this deity, this is interesting because if you realize in Exodus chapter 33, Jesus actually, or rather God, in Exodus chapter 33 verse 20, I'm not sure, you can check it there, God actually shielded Moses. Right? Because in Exodus chapter 33, verse 20, it says here that you cannot see God and live. Right? So what, what does God do? He needed to shield Moses. And all Moses saw was his back after God passed him by. The difference is, if you look at this, 
The difference is, if you look at Jesus, what has happened here was, he didn't just show himself to them, but he got in the boat with them. He got in the boat with them. I was asking yesterday, um, let me open it for a while. I was asking our Leadership 113 students, I was asking them what were the most, what is the most terrifying moment of your life? And what gave you comfort during that specific time? I mean, think about it for a while. What is the most terrifying moment of your life? And during that time, what gave you comfort? Right? Here's what some of them said. Um, um, some of them said uh, it was um, the Zamboanga siege in 2016. It was terrifying, indeed. Right? It was terrifying to witness a war, okay, between government for forces and rebel groups. And you're right in the middle of it. And what gave comfort was relatives and friends. Um, I have another one here. Um, you know, um, there's a 7.1 magnitude earthquake in Cebu, okay, and the building and building. The, um, um, the building was, was uh, re really, uh, what do you call this, uh, shaking. 7.1, that's kind of strong, right? And what gave him comfort during the time? What is this? The table. <laughs> that's what it says. Hid under the table and was fine. All right, so thank God for the table. Someone was magged back in Japan. All right, so... Comfort, perhaps, for the security, the, the perhaps the efficient police force in Japan. Okay, someone, one of them experienced, uh, you know, um, someone getting or uh, a, a robber getting inside her room with an ice pick. Right? So, I, I, I kind of lost lang kung what gave her comfort during that time. Someone was uh, tumitirik na yung mata because of hypertension and... Uh, and what do you call this? And diabetes. Kinabahan ako nung nabasa ko yung kagabi. So, anyway, so, um, tumitirik na yung mata, but, you know, um, the comfort of being with friends and stuff like that. You know, we, we experience all kinds of terrible and terrifying circumstances, isn't it? Right? Um, we, we, we experience different levels of terrifying moments in our life, and there's always something that gives us comfort. It could be, it could be what? It could be your dad. Um, it could be your brother. It could be as simple as ice cream. Right? But I want you to understand this. Look at this. It says here, when they were rowing and there was a strong storm. Let me ask you this. When did they experience fright? When, when was it that they started getting scared? Or, or when were they frightened? I mean, look at your Bible for a while. When were they frightened? Were they frightened during the storm? Pre, let me tell you, these are fishermen. They've experienced something like this before, perhaps stronger storms. They don't care. They can, we, we can do this for like another 12 hours. They were not frightened by the storm. What, fright, what, was, what was the very thing that frightened them? Come on now. It's seeing Jesus walking on water. It's seeing Jesus walking on water. So here's my next question. What gave them comfort during that time? It's Jesus getting in their boat and telling them, don't be frightened, it is I. You know, I realize that if I look at this, I realize that all the terrifying moments in our life, I think the most terrifying moments that we will ever experience is to see the fullness of the glory of God. To see the fullness of the glory of God. I don't know if you've ever looked into this before, but you'd see how people would run away from the mountain because the glory of God is over that mountain. The most terrifying moments that you will ever experience in this lifetime 
is to see the fullness of the glory of God. And yet, the odd thing here is the fact that the most comforting thing that you will ever experience in this lifetime is to see the fullness of the glory of God. Sometimes it feels like it doesn't add up, but that's what the Bible teaches us. It is actually what the Bible teaches us. For the disciples here, they got in the boat. Uh, Jesus gets in the boat and look, and look what the result is. Would you, would you go with me to John chapter 6 for a while? Let's go to John chapter 6. Look at this. I want you to follow this story. Jesus fed the 5,000, right? He feeds the 5,000. The next story is he walks on water, right? So you, you come to understand this is actually one unit because it's after Jesus walking on water. It's the section that talks about him being the bread of life. Okay, now look. Here's the result. Here, here's, here's, here's what happened. Look at, look at John chapter 6. Okay, look at John chapter 6. Um... Let me go to verse 41, okay? Let me go to verse 41. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that comes from heaven. Okay, everyone, follow this with me for a while. Feeds them. He feeds them, right? He feeds them. They want to force him to be their king. Why? Because their tummy is full. Buffet. Buffet of fish, okay? Fish and bread. All right, so what, what does Jesus do? He withdraws, tells, tells his disciples to go on the boat. He walks on water. After that, the moment they land, okay, that same group of people were there with them. He starts teaching them, hey, you guys. Hey, you guys, you had your fill. You're here because you had your fill when I was there. Lahat kayo busog. Now you're here. Here's what I want to tell you. Here's what I want to tell you. Actually, it's not just the miracles. It's not just feeding you. It's not just filling your tummy. It's actually about me. I am, he says, the bread of life. And they're like, oh, you know, you know Moses? He fed us manna in the desert. No, 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 no. I am the bread of life. Feed on me. It was, it was what Jesus was saying. I'm the bread that comes from heaven. You know what happens to them? Verse 41 happened to them. They grumbled. They grumbled. And guess what? One by one, one by one, they started leaving Jesus. Ah, not worth my time. Not worth the effort of following. Bugal bugal man's guru ni. Shakun ang bread from heaven. Starts leaving Jesus. Starts leaving Jesus. Now, look at, look at verse, look at verse 67. Look at verse 67. So now, Jesus said to the twelve, okay, um, guys, are you guys going as well? You guys are leaving me? You guys are leaving me? What's the premise? May story kasi sa gitna. Ano po yung story sa gitna? Jesus walks on water experienced his divinity. So when Jesus asked them, okay, um, all the rest that I have fed, I've also fed you. All the rest of them, they start, they start leaving. Are you leaving me as well? And here's what Simon Peter has to say, Lord. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have what? And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Saan po galing yun? Saan ang galing yun? That confession came coming from an experience of the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. They, were, they wouldn't come to such conclusion if they have not witnessed Jesus walking on water and getting into their boat. Like what I keep telling you, every time something happens, every time they hear something, they always weave this from the what? From the Old Testament. When they heard Jesus say, Do not be frightened. It is I. 
They knew for a fact, man, this man doesn't just have power. He is power. This man right here, our teacher, isn't just associated with God. He is God himself. And as we end, I want us to look into this for a while. And just a few things, okay, just a few things. Um, one of the things that I've observed is this. I realized that they were actually in trouble in the water. Guess what? Because of whom? Because of Jesus. I mean, who asked them to get in the boat? Who asked them to get in the boat? It was Jesus. So meaning to say they were in trouble because they are heeding what Jesus said. Oh, gives me a picture. All right, wait a second. Ah, kaya pala, when Peter, or rather when Paul, said yes to his Macedonian call, when he started what? When he started living a life of obedience, it got him in jail. Got him in jail. Whoever said, whoever said that when you follow Christ, life will be like a bed of roses. Not in the scripture. But the scripture does tell us that for those who follow him and are called according to his purpose, we understand that God works for the good of all of those people. So sometimes the good is not the good that you have in your mind right now. Sometimes the good is not one million pesos. Sometimes the good is not house and lot. Sometimes the good is adversity and experiencing Jesus in that very adversity. One thing we need to understand is Jesus was right there in the eye of the storm with them. Right smack in the eye of the storm. Gives me a picture that at the end of the day, I realized that, you know, providence is purposive. It's not like, it's not like you experience hardship randomly. I want you to understand that. You folks realize, I, I, I think I've, I've mentioned this a couple of times, sometimes our suffering, yung suffering natin, our suffering is sometimes consequential or providential. Sometimes you suffer because of your own doing. You suffer because you got in a relationship uh, that you realize, eh, this is a bad relationship. Sometimes you suffer because you, you wasted so much money. Sometimes you suffer because we, we didn't take care of our health and stuff like that. But sometimes suffering is providential. And I want you to understand this. It's always purposive. God always has a purpose for the pain that you are experiencing right now. The scars that you have right now as a Christian reminds you of Jesus keeping you and molding your character in that very season. I want us to understand that Jesus' intervention wasn't or didn't, Jesus' intervention didn't happen when he showed up. Because truth of the matter is, he was there all along. If that was a strong wind, they could have, their, their boat could have capsized and they could have drowned. So I, I want to ask this question to, to all of you and you don't have to answer loudly. Do you feel like God or Jesus is silent in your life? If you feel like Jesus is silent in your life, you're embracing a one big fat lie. Because that isn't true. If you're in the, if you're in the middle of Experiencing all of these difficulties. Um, I look at this and I realize, okay, number one, they were in trouble because of Jesus. Here's another thing. Here's another thing. It was Jesus who told them to go. And then he arrives what? At the fourth watch of the night. Lord, eight hours? Seven hours? You know, sometimes we're like that. We feel like Jesus keeps making us wait. And who am I? Just be honest with me. Just be honest with me. Who am I? You hate waiting. Okay, ako po. Ako na lang. Kahit sa globe, ayoko po talaga maghintay. 
I hate waiting. And sometimes, we look at this, that, you know, Jesus makes us wait to what? To elicit faith. Kasi pag walang waiting period, hindi rin tayo nag-exercise ng faith natin. So ngayon, okay, so ngayon, si Jesus is like, okay, let's, let's try to build some character. Okay, being, being a Christian, you guys want to be Christ-like? Then let's try to learn to wait so that in the midst of that waiting, your faith gets developed. You start understanding who I am. And you start understanding what I can do for your life. And this is what we find here. He comes to his disciples in the midst of a storm after several hours. And it is as if they didn't learn anything from it. In fact, when Jesus showed up, and Jesus tells them, it is I, do not be frightened. In John chapter 6, verse 6, 61, they started making a confession, truly, this is the Son of God. Truly, this is the Son of God. The unmasked glory of God, as displayed here, gives us a picture of His comfort as well. And I pray for many of you here today, um, if you are experiencing external storms, external storms in finance, relationship, health, perhaps you're so, 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 so lonely and sad that you don't understand yourself, or perhaps there's some mental distress that's running your mind right now, perhaps you cannot even understand your own emotions, if you're experiencing external storms and internal storms, I want you to understand is Jesus gets in the boat with you. I'm not saying that as a like a, 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 a faith, prosperity preacher, stuff like that. I'm just sharing the story that we have here. Jesus gets in the boat with them. And simply tells them, do not be frightened, it is I. Do not be frightened, it is I. I pray that in the midst of this difficulties that you may experience, that you may be experiencing, I pray that you will form in your mind, that you will start forming in your mind a category for who Jesus is. And this category is this. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, maker and ruler of all creations, our blessed hope, our one true Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your grace in our life. Lord, we look at this story and we realize, Lord, a great demonstration of your glory and power. But this isn't just a demonstration of your great glory and power. We also understand, Lord, that this is also a demonstration of your compassion. So, Lord, we combine that in our minds right now. We combine that, Lord, in our minds right now. Looking at this story in Mark chapter 6 and John chapter 6, we understand, Lord, as we combine these two things, that you are powerful and you are compassionate. Lord, for us to think that you have, you have displayed your glory in the midst of unbelief, oh, Lord, it tells us then that it is indeed true that nothing in this world could ever separate us from the love of God in Christ, in you. So Lord, may we take comfort in those words. It is I. It is I. Lord Jesus, we understand. God the Father, we know that you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. We see in Colossians, Lord Jesus, that you're the one who holds all things together. That you reign and you're sovereign and you're superior over any other gods out there. And so, Lord, we fix our eyes on you. Well, all heads are bowed and all heads are closed. I'm going to pray for some of you for a while. If you're here today and you are in the midst 
of a storm, internal or external. I want to pray for you. Just lift your hands before God for a while. All right. Thank you for lifting them. Just lift them before God. Lift them before God for a while. I want to pray for you. Lord, you see these hands lifted before you. No one could ever, not our friends, not our best friends, not even our friends in the church, could ever describe describe the category or the intensity of our storms right now. Both the external one and the internal one. But Lord, we look back to the story we're in, we realize that, oh, wait a second, Lord, it was actually you who stood up. It was actually you, Lord, who stood up and you rebuked the wave and the wind. It gives us a picture, God, Lord, that the waves and the wind obeyed to you. That everything, Lord, in this created order, God, are submissive to you. And so, Lord, here we are. We submit our emotions to you, Lord. Here we are, God. We submit our emotions to you. Lord, we submit ourselves to you. Lord, this storm is ransacking so many things in my life. But it can never take away my faith in you. It can never take away my commitment and my devotion to you. That is my confession, Lord. Like what may have happened to Job, God. He may have lost everything, but he remained devoted to you. Lord, by your grace, allow us to have the same position. Allow us, Lord, to bless your name in the highs and the lows, in the mountains and in the valleys. Allow us, Lord, to experience, Lord, the magnitude of your glory. So, Lord, all together, all of us, Lord, we're lifting our hands here together. We confess with our mouth today, Jesus, you are Lord over all creation. Jesus, you are our Lord and our Savior. We battle, Lord, the confessions of Peter. Lord, in the midst of our trouble, God, Lord, we battle the words of Peter. Who else has the words of eternal life other than you, Lord? We battle the words of Lord of Peter, Father God, when he confessed, you are indeed the Son of God. Lord, I also pray here today that you would indeed rebuke the winds and the wave the winds and the wave cause these things to be still allow us Lord to experience your goodness in this season of our life if we are treading Lord or getting into place of unbelief we repent God we repent Lord Lord, we repent when we start thinking that you cannot provide. Lord, we repent when we start thinking that you are not good to us. Lord, we repent, Lord, when we start thinking that you cannot make us well. Lord, we repent, Lord, when we start thinking that it's all about our own capacities or it's all about our own uh, doing or things that we can do for our own selves. Lord, we repent, Lord, when we start thinking or start acting like you cannot do something about our situation. But instead, Lord, we want to come to a place wherein we will firmly believe and confess with our words and with our life that you are the maker of all things that you are the ruler of our destinies, that the trials that we may be experiencing, Lord, will bring something or a lot, of, a lot of good things in us to the glory of your name. We praise you. We adore you. We bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Can we just give God praises for this for a while?